It goes back to day one when uh, I, when I went to work for Boeing in the uh, early mid '60s. Uh, Boeing had just kicked off this program, and I started working on this airplane um, when I first came to work for Boeing. And this particular airplane, I, I was working as a liaison engineer in the factory and uh, helped put it together. Now a lot of people obviously were involved in putting the airplane together, but um, I always felt took it to, to my heart. I always felt a special kinship with this airplane. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to start our walk around. We're going to I'm going to check the fluids on both engines. I'm going to clean the struts. I'm going to check all the tire pressures. And then if that's all okay, we'll install the battery and, uh, and then start powering up the airplane. Well, also, we have to remove all our all of our uh, covers and what have you. These are two tires I'm going to replace sometime in the next two months. Or so. and, and a brake, one of the brakes over there. The official rollout was in December of of uh, '66. Okay. And. Uh, it made its first flight in April of 67. It was actually put together. It was rolled out of the factory first time in, in uh, August, September of 66. See, the first eight airplanes were built in Plant 2 at, at Boeing Field. We can, I'll show you what that is tomorrow. And then Boeing built a special factory for the 737 called the Thompson Site. And the next 392 airplanes were built down there. Then they moved to production to Renton. And it's been in two different places in Renton, so they actually produces in four different places so far. Engine oil, and here we're looking at the CSD oil. Constant speed drive. And that's good to go. There's a little sight glass in there. I don't know if you really want to see that or not. Yeah. Everybody thought the airplane was late to the market since the BAC 111 and DC 9 were in service and had, had a two year lead on the airplane, and it was a question of how many. How much market could be divided among three players? And uh, but uh, over time, the airplane just continued to sell, and uh, airplane really proved itself. It's a tremendous airplane. I've worked on it, and flown it, and done everything on it my whole life. That must have been my last helper. I didn't realize he did that. I'm going to open the reverser doors and I won't be able to look in the tailpipe when, later on when I do my walk around. So what I'm looking for is making sure all the blades are there. There's no debris there. That all, everything looks clear, which it does. This is, this is amazing. You see all this? this is, it's so windy over here. Even though those covers were in place, you see? This, this uh, sand and debris, you know, covers everything. Family car. That's good. One forty eight. This one's a little more complicated. I've got a leaky valve stem, but uh, I need to change the stem just temporarily to check the pressure. Put in the long stem. That's, uh, and a half. That, that's NASA's name, you know, that's what they called it over the years, Fat Albert. Yeah, in fact, they, they wrote a poem to, about it, the ode to Fat Albert, 134. 
Have there been any other nicknames for the aeroplane over the years? Yeah. Yeah, when the aeroplane first came out, it was known as Lil Toot. L-I-L apostrophe T-O-O-T. We thought it was pretty short and stubby. And then, during the flight test program, it was changed to Crew of Two. Um, because the, they were in a dispute with Alpha over the time whether it should be a two or three man airplane. The people there really loved this airplane and they were really sorry to see it go. It was replaced by a 5.7. You see these patches here? That's because the pitot tubes used to be here. So the Boeing could figure out everything in the wind tunnel beforehand except where to put the pitot masts and where to put the static vents. And this is done by a bunch of trial and error. They trail a cone behind the airplane during flight test and they get they get true air speeds. You can see all of these static vents. These are all the places that they experimented with before you before they wound up at the final position. So you won't find this on any other airplane except this. With the exception of the 727 and now the 777, Boeing has essentially retained all of the prototype airplanes. And that's because they were deemed economically uh, not viable to convert them into a certifiable com you know, commercial configuration. So after this airplane flew as a flight test airplane for Boeing during the early days of the development of 737. And, uh, and then it, afterwards Boeing sold it to NASA and it stayed as a flight test airplane for another 30 years. Cleaning the oleos, the struts here, you know, of all this sand and grit, you see. This isn't what they do in the normal airline service, I can guarantee you, but this is what you do when you want to baby your airplane. And what happens, you get this sand up in the seals there, and then you cut the seals and you start having leaks. This is a Eastern Washington tumbleweed. That's what you get over here, they tumbleweeds and they blow. Sometimes the fences are full of them. Just like in the Western movies. Just like in the Western movies. This is the West. This is one like one of these Bulgarian Olympic weightlifting deals. It's it's in two yells, okay? So don't be surprised. This airplane battery, I take care of it in my garage. I have a charging station for uh, several of my airplane battery. This two-step two step hoist here. Farewell, Fat Albert. 737 retirement ceremony. This is, uh, and if you come over here, you can see this. This thing is full of plaques everywhere. 